Welcome to High School Physics Explained. What does the apple have to do with Sir Isaac Newton? And why was Apple's first logo a picture of Sir Isaac Newton sitting underneath a tree? Thankfully, that logo has changed. Well, the legend goes is that Sir Isaac Newton was sitting under a tree and an apple fell on his head and he wondered what causes the apple to fall. Now, the story was probably embellishment. There was an apple tree growing outside of his mother's window and certainly he would have seen apples fall. In fact, Newton embellished the story. He was thinking about why the moon traveled around the earth and what held it there. And he came up with this idea of gravity. That gravity is some sort of force at a distance, something to do with the mass of the object that causes an object to be attracted to the earth. So the apple is experiencing gravity and the moon is experiencing gravity. It's the same concept and that the earth was responsible for this gravity. And so here we have the earth and around the earth is this thing called a gravitational field. Here's my apple and it is experiencing a force and it is causing it to be attracted. And no matter how far the apple is away from the earth, it is always experiencing a force. The further the way the apple is, the weaker that force is, but nonetheless, gravity is that force at a distance and acting instantaneously that causes the apple to accelerate towards the earth. It's the same with the moon. The moon is also in the earth's gravitational field. And if the moon was further away, the force of attraction will be weaker, gravity will be weaker, and if the moon was closer, the gravity will be stronger. It's the same concept, that gravity exerts forces on both the apple and the moon. Now, why does the moon not fall into the earth? Well, actually it does, but because it's moving in a circular path, it is constantly falling around in a circle. It's just not getting closer. But we have a little problem here. The fact is, is that if there is this concept of gravity that is somehow a property of the Earth's mass, then the apple also has its own gravitational field. That is, the Earth is attracted to the apple because the Earth is in the apple's gravitational field. Similarly speaking, the moon has its own gravitational field. The apple would be attracted towards the moon the apple in the gravitational field of the moon. And similarly speaking, the Earth is attracted towards the moon because the Earth is in the gravitational field of the moon. So that brings us to this concept. We have the Earth here and we have the apple and the moon at different distances away from the Earth. But both of them are exerting equal forces on each other because they are in each other's gravitational field. So what we have is, is that we have this a mutual attraction between the two. That gravity isn't something that just the Earth applies on the apple, but at the apple also applies onto the Earth. And these two forces are equal. In other words, this is a application of Newton's third law, that there is this mutual attraction, equal forces, but then opposite directions. This is true as well for the moon. Now, in this case, the moon is much larger than the apple. The distances are greater. What we're saying here is, is that this force is somehow dependent on both masses and also the distance between them, because obviously the further the object is away, the weaker the force gets. So what does this force depend on? It depends on the first thing, on the mass of the object. And we're going to just concentrate on the Earth and the moon. So we have mass one. Then we have mass two. So both masses contribute to this force of attraction, this gravitational force between them. Now there is the factor of the distance between them, which we will call R. And by the way, the distance is always measured from the center of masses of the objects. What is the relationship between these variables? Newton developed the law of gravitation, which is that the force that exists between these two objects is proportional, first of all, to the product of the masses. So both M1 and M2 contribute to the force. But it is inversely proportional to not the distance between them, but the distance squared. This combination, the product of the masses and the R squared, is what F is proportional to. So let's have an example here. And I have two masses here, and I'm going to call this M1 and this one M2. 
And let's say the distance between them here is going to be r. So let's make this force equal to one Newton. So in other words, if we have m1 and m2 at a distance of r squared, since f is proportional to this, let's make this aspect here equivalent to one Newton. What would happen if I increase the distance between them? Now what I have is I now have a distance between them as r times two. What is the new force? Well, the force is of course proportional to m1, m2 over the distance. Now here we have two r, and so this becomes squared. And so what we get is m1, m2 over 4r squared. Since this thing here was equal to one Newton, we now have a quarter of a Newton in terms of the forces between these two masses. Let's say now I make this half the distance, but I also increase the mass. So I have now a distance here of r over two, and I make this 2m1, and this just 1m2. What is the new force now? Again, the force is proportional to m1, m2 over r squared. Now I have 2m1, I still have m2, and on the bottom I have r over 2 all squared. That becomes 2m1, m2 over, now I get a quarter here, so we have a quarter, the distance between them, and I have r squared. That gives me 8m1, m2 over r squared. So now, considering that we made this value 1 Newton, I now have an 8 Newton force between the two. So what is the law of gravitation? Well, if f is proportional to m1, m2 over r squared, then if I divide those two, I get a constant. In other words, if I want to make this relationship an equation, then all I need is have a constant value. And that constant value is g. And g is the gravitational constant, which has a value of 6.67 by 10 to the power of negative 11. The unit for that will be newtons, meters squared per kilogram squared. You can see that the gravitational constant is really small. So, the gravitational force between two objects is going to be reasonably insignificant for small masses. So for example, if you are sitting next to someone you like and their mass was 60 kilograms and your mass was also 60 kilograms and you're separated by let's say the distance of one meter, then your gravitational attraction is going to be the value that is g multiplied by the product of your masses divided by the distance between you squared. When you calculate that out, you get a value of 2.4 by 10 to the power of negative seven Newtons. So clearly the level of attraction between you two will be, in terms of gravity, really, really small. Where it really starts to play is when we have masses such as planets where we have extremely large masses. So the gravitational force is going to be more significant. So now we can come to a definition of the gravitational field strength. And the definition of a gravitational field strength is simply the determined by the force per unit mass. Now the force we know is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. That is the force that exists between any two objects. But then we divide it by the mass that we have in that field. So that's going to be our m2. And so that will become g m, which is the mass that is creating the gravitational field, divided by r squared. And that is equal to a value called g. Now, you may be familiar with g in terms of the acceleration due to gravity. But in fact, the acceleration due to gravity is actually the gravitational field strength, and it has the unit 
of meters per second squared. Where you've got to be careful is that, that the value of 9.8 meters per second squared is determined by the mass of the Earth and the distance you are away from the Earth, which is in the, this R squared. So our value for 9.8 meters per second squared is determined by the Earth's mass, which is 6 by 10 to the power of 24, and the radius, which is 6,300 and 71 kilometers approximately. In other words, if we sit on a larger mass or we are further away from this mass, then the acceleration due to gravity or the gravitational field strength will vary. So now let's have a look at an example. So here I have an astronaut jumping on the moon. And my question is this, what is the weight on the astronaut on the moon? And is acceleration due to gravity? What we're really asking is the weight, which is actually the force due to gravity. That's really what we're actually determining. What is this acceleration? Well, that is the gravitational field strength. Now we need a number of variables. And the first thing we need to know is the masses of the objects. So the mass of our astronaut is going to be 130 kilograms. And our mass of the moon is going to be 7.34 by 10 to the power of 22 kilograms. And then lastly, we need to know the distance between the astronaut and the center of the moon. And it's the radius. And that's going to be 1737 kilometers. So let's have a look at the first part. His force of attraction is going to be equal to G multiplied by M1 multiplied by M2 over R squared. That will give us 6.67 by 10 to the power of negative 11 multiplied by his mass and the mass of the moon divided by the radius squared. When we calculate that out, we're going to get 210.9 newtons. So there is the force of attraction between the astronaut and the moon. Make it clear, this is the same force that the astronaut applies onto the moon. It's a force due to Newton's third law. So what is the gravitational field strength or what is the value for G? Well, all we need to know is the force, which we just calculated out, and divide that by the mass of the astronaut. We're simply cancelling out the 130 and we get a value of 1.6 meters per second squared. That is in the gravitational field strength, that is the acceleration due to gravity, 1.6 meters per second squared. How good is Newton's law of gravitation? One of the things that Newton did was explain Kepler's third law. And what is Kepler's third law? Well, Kepler, looking at the orbit of planets around the sun and each having different radii, they all had different periods at which they go around. And using Tycho Brahe's data, he established an important relationship. He said that if you get the radius cubed and divide it by the period squared, you're going to get a constant value. But he wasn't able to explain why it was constant. And this is where Newton stepped in. He said, well, the law of gravitation, which is G M1 M2 over R squared, is causing the centripetal force that causes the planet to go around the sun, which is M V squared over R. From that, he established that V is equal to the square root of G M over R, the orbital velocity. But since the velocity of any object is simply the circumference divided by the period, he established that when you put the two together, you're going to get R cubed over T squared is equal to G M over four pi squared. My video on Kepler's third law looks at this a bit closer. You can see that this value is a constant. G, the mass of the central object, and four pi squared are all constants. So he established an explanation for Kepler's third law. In the 1970s, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were launched to distant parts of the solar system. How did they calculate the path? Simply using Newton's law of gravitation by understanding the position of the planets at various points in their trajectory around the sun, they were able to accurately direct Voyager in such a way that it could slingshot around the planets and gain momentum 
as they moved to different parts of the solar system. However, despite all this, Newton's law of gravitation is wrong. What? It was Einstein in the early part of the 20th century who developed the theory of general relativity. I won't go into the details of the theory, but in essence, he established that gravity wasn't a force to begin with. That gravity is the distortion of space-time. That is, an object with mass bends the fabric of space or the fabric of space-time. And that is what causes objects to accelerate. So even though Newton's law of gravitation, that is, the idea of a force at a distance, works pretty well in most circumstances, in actual fact, when you start dealing with concepts of light and so forth, it breaks down. And so the theory of general relativity provides a better, and in fact supersedes, the explanation of Sir Isaac Newton's law of gravitation. But that is a subject for a future video. Well, I hope that helps you understand the concepts. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.